Well, hello and welcome once again to Word for the Week, our online book study and devotional series here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church in Bloomingdale, Illinois. My name is Jeremy Heidkamp, and I am the pastor of Cornerstone Faith Community Church, and I'm so glad to be with you as we continue our look at uh, the book by Jerry Bridges, uh, The Discipline of Grace. We are in chapter 9 this week, and... Um, Bridges has called this the discipline of commitment. Um, We're basically going to talk about that idea of committing ourselves to God uh, today. And Bridges does that by starting with Psalm 119, verse 106. Um, Psalm 119 is the longest psalm, or the longest uh, chapter of Scripture, um, and the longest psalm. Um, portions of it written by King David himself, maybe the whole thing by him, we're just not 100% sure. Um, but this is the 106th verse of 119. Uh, here the psalmist writes, I've taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous law. There is this idea of taking an oath, confirming that oath, because there is a commitment there. There is a desire, an intention to follow after God's righteous law. On um, page 141, at the very beginning of the chapter, Bridges talks about a cartoon that he had seen in his local newspaper where a man is clutching in one hand a suicide note about to jump off of a cliff, but then he also has a parachute strapped to his back, and his wife says, hey, you really have trouble committing to just about anything, don't you? Including the idea of your suicide. Uh, It's supposed to be humorous. Of course, it's not um, because of two things. One, we're talking about something terrible like suicide, but secondly, because this is how our society functions. Bridges writes this. He says, the time-honored virtue of commitment, once so highly esteemed, has fallen on hard times. Like the man in the cartoon, people seem adverse to committing themselves to anything these days. We have surely found this in the life of our church. I'm sure um, many, many folks, every church has experienced this. There there tends to be sometimes a lack of commitment on the part of the people to uh, participate in various different um, studies or meetings or worship services or special events or whatever it might be. Um, As I was reading that, I, I thought of this Um, idea, and I wanted to share it with you, I think it's much easier for us to commit to ourselves or um, even maybe to another person um, than it is to commit to God because the world views God as if he's invisible, right? How many times have skeptics said, why do you trust in God? You can't even see him. Why do you trust in something you can't see? How do you even know it exists? Why trust that, right? I, so I think it's a lot easier for us to trust in things other than God because we can see them, we can touch them, we can feel them. But when it comes to making a commitment to trusting fully God, um, at least the world would say, well, that doesn't make any sense. You're, you're trusting, you're committing yourself to something that can't even be seen. Um, well, we know God can be seen and he is seen um, in nature, in his creation, in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds. Um, We see him in so many ways as he's working in our lives. Um, I was also thinking about three statements that I hear people make often. The first statement is something like, I go to church. People say that all the time. I go to church. I'm a member of a church. I I go to church on Sunday morning. Well, that's one kind of statement. Uh, A second statement I hear people make is uh, they'll say, I believe in God. I believe in God. Um, Again, another kind of statement. Both of those statements... I go to church and I believe in God. Uh, The problem with them is that they leave room for a lack of commitment. What might be a better phrase to hear people say? Something like, I am fully submissive to my God, to God my Father. I submit myself fully to Him. That idea of submitting fully to Him leaves very little room for a lack of commitment. If you're going to submit yourself fully, you're going to commit. So uh, Bridges goes on to talk about how far too often our sin comes out of um, 
how we feel about things or how things make us feel. And so we go, well, gosh, I have this sin in my life and it makes me feel terrible. Well, I'm sure it does. But the point of the sin is not how it makes you feel. It's how it makes you look, how it makes you, what, what it makes your status to be before God, your father. That sin stands between you and God and it, and it, and it breaks you off that path of righteousness. Um, and so Bridges writes at the bottom of page 143, we need to work at ensuring that our commitment to holiness is a commitment to God himself, not to us or our own self-esteem or how we feel. Um, That is so critically important for us to remember. The idea of committing to God isn't so that we feel good about ourselves. It isn't so that we feel like we've fulfilled an obligation or something of that nature. A true commitment to God is about God. It's about us submitting fully to him, recognizing him, acknowledging him in all we do and say, letting him lead us by his spirit. Um, A little bit later on in the chapter, Bridges brings up the idea of intentions. He asks the question, what are your intentions? Um, It's interesting because when we are involved in a marriage ceremony, um, one of the parts of the traditional marriage ceremony is um, the acknowledgement of intentions. Um, And so what is that part of the service? Well, this is the part where um, we would typically say something like, uh, will you have this woman or this man to be your husband or your wife? Will you um, love her, honor her, cherish her, um, care for her? Uh, Basically, I always tell the couples that I am counseling, the declaration of intentions, the recognition of intentions in the marriage ceremony is the point at which we say, okay, Nobody has a shotgun to your head, right? You really want to do this. It is really your heart's desire to marry this person. Um, We're declaring our intention to marry them. When we talk about intentions, Bridges says um, that it it brings to to mind this idea of um, submission to God. Do you intend to submit to him? back to the marriage thing. Do you intend to marry him? Do you intend to love him? Do you intend to honor him? Now, go to God. Do you intend to submit to him? Do you intend to love him? Do you intend to honor him? Do you intend to... And it can almost begin to feel a bit like slavery, maybe, um, where we have this idea that If you're going to submit fully to God, you're going to do everything fully for him. You're going to live for him, love him, honor him, obey him. Every thought, word, action is going to be for him, for his glory, for his kingdom. It starts to sound a bit like slavery. But I want to offer you this thought. When we are enslaved to God, when we are in slavery to God, that slavery to God occupies all of our time. Therefore, we are left with no other option. We are left with no other thing to be committed to. The only option we have when we are fully submissive in this sort of slavery to God is to strive for holiness before him. That's it. And that's the sweet spot of where we need to be. Bridges, um, in the last part of this chapter, then he starts to talk about specific ways that we make a commitment to God. He starts to talk about, uh, for example, um, um, Daniel and Job. You know, Job made a commitment to God. His commitment was related to how Job had lusted after uh, a woman. And he said, I won't do that. I make a commitment. I will not lust after uh, uh, women anymore. Um, Daniel made a commitment saying that he wouldn't eat foods that violated the the laws of Moses and the commands of God. Um, There are many other instances in Scripture. When it comes to these specific commitments and intentions to be committed to God, our intention to be committed to Him, I think we actually have to do a self-diagnosis here. We've actually got to look at our sin. We've got to look at our lives. We've got to look at our our intentions. And we got to ask a question. Where are we at on that? 
Where, where are we in, in our commitment to God? Where are we in our sin? Where are we in our confession? Where are we in our, um, uh, our, our giving God an opportunity to forgive us of that sin and help us turn away from that sin? So we got to do some self-diagnosis here because listen, you are your own greatest critic. Nobody knows your sin like you do. Well, at least outside of God. No one else outside of God knows your sin like you do. And so where are the places where you need to make a different kind of commitment? One that is a, a commitment towards God. On page 152, Bridges writes this amazing sentence at the, about two-thirds of the way down. He says this, People will help you compromise your integrity if you have not already made a commitment to be absolutely honest and here he's talking about business doings, but in anything, if you have not made a commitment to be 100% honest before God about all things, people are going to give you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to lack commitment before God. Even people within your church will do that sometimes. People as a whole are eager, eager, to help us sin. That moves bridges into talking about motives and motivation. If we're going to have a good intention before God, an intention to commit to him, we got to talk about what motivates us to have that good intention. Um, we are called to perfection before God. Now, let's talk about that perfection for just a second. We are called to aim for perfect, aim for holy, Desire it, want it, strive for it, live for it. But we have to understand that in our sinful human nature, we cannot attain perfection. One day when we are gathered together with Christ, after we have stood before God at the mercy seat of Christ and we have made an account for our sin um, and Christ has won the battle against the sin for us um, before God our Father, we will then know perfection. In the meantime, God has seen fit to give us something called grace. We are called to aim for protect for perfection. Grace makes up the difference between my sinful human nature and the perfection that I am called to in God my Father. What makes up that space? What fills up that space? Grace. I don't know that on this side of heaven, this side of being united with Christ, this side of glory, it necessarily makes me perfect before God. But all of that space between where I am able to achieve in my sinfulness and where God wants me to be in his perfect will, grace fills that up. So it doesn't look like I've stopped trying, like I haven't made a commitment to him. God gives us the extra grace we need to fulfill that commitment to him. So this discipline of commitment is critical. It's what leads us right back to the discipline of grace. If we have any hope for holiness, if we have any hope for thriving in the discipline of grace, we have got to also have the discipline of a intentional commitment to God our Father. I hope you are having a great week this week. Uh, hope you enjoyed our Labor Day holiday off. Um, and um, I, I look forward to opening up chapter 10 with you next week as we're going to talk about the discipline of convictions. Um, but in the meantime, I hope that you'll find some great opportunities to be with the Lord in, in his word, in prayer, in study. Um, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Have a great rest of your week.